The final item of business is members' business debate on motion 13890 in the name of Oliver Mundell on the cycle to Syracuse to mark the 30th anniversary of the Locker Bay disaster. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Oliver Mundell to open the debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 30 years ago, on the shortest and darkest day, Pan Am Flight 103 left Heathrow Airport for New York. Shortly after crossing into Scottish airspace and gaining clearance for the trip over Atlant the Atlantic, Flight 103 exploded over Lock the Lockerbie area, killing 243 passengers, 16 crew and 11 on the ground. For many of the victims' families and those in the town who were caught up in the events and aftermath of the 21st of December 1988, there is before Lockerbie and there is after Lockerbie. Born almost a day to the year later, I, like an ever-growing number of people, have only ever known one Lockerbie, and I could not be more proud of my association with the town. It may be full of characters, as some American visitors have pointed out, but better characters you would be hard pushed to find. Lockerbie, more than anything, has heart, a quiet determination to move forward and make the best of things. Friendly, open and welcoming, partly because it is and partly because it has had to be. Presiding officer, the words penned about gentle Lockerbie in On Eagle's Wings, written by the mother of one of the victims, are too painful to quote here today, but they are worth reading and reflecting upon. They capture the complicated relationship between the victims on the ground and those in the air. Everyone thinks they know Lockerbie, but until you've stood in the high street and watched life go on as normal, almost as if nothing had happened, it is impossible to understand the achievement. Because it is by letting life go on that those who have sought to sow division and fear have not prevailed. But it has not come without a cost. The scars are not far beneath the surface. Visually, Lockerbie is healed, but emotionally for many, the subject is still raw. The same grit, determination and complexity can be found in America and beyond, where the families and institutions and individuals have kept the memory alive, but also focused on the future. Indeed, for many on both sides of the Atlantic, perhaps the only universally positive thing to come from the disaster is the strong bonds and connections that have been formed. Arguably, the link between Lockerbie Academy and Syracuse University in upstate New York embodies this best and is the most tangible link for many. In the aftermath of Pan Am 103, Syracuse University, as an institution, promised that they would not forget their students and pledged to honour their memory through learning and teaching so that tragedies like Pan Am 103 would not be repeated. The 35 Remembrance Scholars and two Lockerbie Scholars who study at Syracuse every year are one of the ways the university strives to fulfill their promise to remember all victims, including 35 of their own students. Through these scholarships, students are encouraged to exchange ideas and to educate themselves and others about the effect of terrorism. 30 years on, the university has not only held true to that promise, it has opened the doors to the families and communities of all 270 victims holding an annual Remembrance Week in October, and it has built up an extensive archive, helping capture an important moment in our collective history. The success of these programmes cannot be denied, and they have inspired and brought out the best in human nature. Presiding officer, to paraphrase the words of a former student, the network of Lockerbie and Remembrance Scholars have now gone on to become global advocates, educators, activists, government officials, scientists, entrepreneurs and entertainers, all the while embodying the spirit of those lost on Pan Am 103. Of course, everyone involved with or touched by the events of 1988 wish uh, that they were not involved. Uh, but uh, together, our communities have rediscovered the best in human nature, recognising that we are both unintended victims. That said, like many people living locally, I still want the past to stay in the past. 
to remember, yes, but at the same time for people and the town to have the chance to move forward. That remains my view, but through this project, I have realised that there will be no closure. After 30 years, those events cannot be wished away. It's easy to think there is nothing we can do or to try and sidestep the issues, which I so nearly did when Colin Dorrance first got in touch. However, in the midst of the Remembrance Scholarship Programme, there is some good advice for us all. Look back and act forward. That, for me, is what the cycle to Syracuse is all about. In 1988, a journey began that was not completed. 30 years on, the cycle to Syracuse intends to continue that journey. It aims to complete the 3,238 miles between Lockerbie and the University in upstate New York, which lost 35 of its finest students. This is a memorial tour by the community in Lockerbie on behalf of the whole town to demonstrate our ongoing support for the families and friends of all the victims of the Lockerbie bombing. In resuming this journey, we remember those lost and those who were affected in the aftermath, the response of the townspeople and the thousands who came to help. But it's not just about reflecting or dwelling on the past, it's about constructing a better future. The aim is to focus on the ongoing relationship between Lockerbie and Syracuse University today, to celebrate the hundreds of bonds that have emerged and will endure forever. The symbolism of the journey is undeniable. Completing the journey, linking together our communities, creating new connections, turning words into action, and sometimes the need just to go through the motions. Most importantly, it is an excuse to talk and reflect. Even the gift of the crook made by the Lockerbie Men's Shed from wood sourced from the Tundergarth area where the nose cone of the plane fell has deep meaning. For me though, the most significant message has come from seeing over 1,600 pupils from the Lockerbie Academy catchment take part in this initiative, using pupil power to get the team across the Atlantic Ocean. Their excitement at being involved alone makes the whole thing worthwhile. And even as primary sevens, there are a number of young people already planning on becoming the Syracuse scholars of the future. There is too the possibility that they will benefit from the funds raised by local charity Soul Soup uh, from the journey who plan to enhance mental health support at Lockerbie Academy. Of course, at the heart of this project is an incredible team and I'm delighted that they can join us in the gallery. At the helm is organiser Colin, who was amongst the first police on the scene in 1988 as an 18-year-old rookie policeman. He had the vision and determination to turn this idea into reality and has a close connection to Syracuse, where his son was a Lockerbie scholar. Next up is Paul, a serving firefighter in the Lockerbie crew. Paul is the joker in the deck, and I'm sure that his sense of humour will come in handy in the home street. Heavy, who joined mountain rescue workers scouring the hills in the aftermath of the disaster, shows that age is no barrier, and he is the local favourite to be first over the finishing line. Brian, who is the head teacher at Lockerbie Academy and new to cycling, is certainly leading by example. He also represents the wider community and its successful changing of the guard at the school. David completes the team. Maybe it's his paramedic training, but he is the one who looks after everyone else, thoughtful and reflective. In my constituency office, we think of them a bit like a boy band. Uh, we've nicknamed them the Mammals, uh, short for middle-aged men in Lycra. <laughs> I'm presiding officer, if you look up to the gallery, uh, you will see that that description is of course more generous to some members of the team uh, than to others. In a few weeks time, I look forward to performing my own role as one of the backing dancers and joining the chair of Lockerbie Community Council, Jan Andrews, on a tandem for the final miles into Syracuse. Although thousands of miles away, to me that seemed more realistic than joining the Feckin Flyers and community riders on the 70 miles from Lockerbie to Edinburgh Castle. The joy here is that there really is something for everyone in this initiative, and the core team have a grateful community behind them, both at home and abroad. That's why, in conclusion, presiding officer, I simply want to say thank you 
and wish the team and all those involved in the cycle the best of luck. Forward Lockerbie and on to Syracuse, where we have forged so many friendships. Thank you. Uh, before we move on to the open debate, can I ask those in the gallery um, to make that the last time that they cheer, hiss, boo or otherwise? <laughs> Thank you. And we now move to the open debate. Speeches of around four minutes, please. Joan McAlpine, followed by Finlay Carson. Thank you. Can I start by congratulating Oliver Mundell for securing this very important debate? And can I also congratulate him on the timing of the debate? The 30th anniversary of the Lockerbie disaster is more than two months away, but by drawing Parliament's attention uh, to the Cycle to Syracuse Memorial Tour now, more people will be able to follow the cyclists on their epic journey, and it gives plenty of time to donate to the Just Giving page they have set up to support Soul Soup. The attack on Pan Am one, uh, Flight 103 in 1988 was a terrible act of violence, the worst mass murder Scotland has ever experienced. 259 passengers and crew aboard the plane and 11 more people on the ground lost their lives in the most awful way and we must never forget that. I was privileged to attend the 25th anniversary commemoration in Lockerbie and meet some of the relatives of those murdered on the plane uh, who had travelled across the world. Uh, what struck me when I spoke to them, and Oliver Mundell has already alluded to this, was the very special place that they had in, in their hearts for the town of Lockerbie and its people. Uh, because despite the shock and the scale of the disaster, the townspeople showed so much humanity at the time, uh, helping recover the dead and their possessions and assisting the emergency services, opening uh, their homes and their hearts to the families. And that has, of course, continued long after the wreckage was cleared away uh, with the support the people of Lockerbie continue to give the bereaved and the special relationships they have formed with those across the world, not least Syracuse University, which lost 35 young students. The cycle is an initiative which is typical of that Lockerbie spirit. It completes the journey home. Those young people from Syracuse never finished. And it's a deeply appropriate response, I think, because it involves the four emergency services which dealt with the aftermath of the bombing in the most professional way that night. It's also very appropriate that it includes the head teacher of Lockerbie Academy, a school which, as Oliver Mundell has said, has formed such a strong bond with Syracuse uh, because of the scholars it sends every year, uh, a programme that has been in the past supported by both the Scottish and the UK governments. Uh, many pupils of the academy and the surrounding schools are, as Oliver has said, completing the journey virtually, which is marvellous. Uh, and I would also, like Oliver Mundell, uh, like to pay tribute to the other community organisations who are supporting the cycle in different ways, including the Lockerbie Men's Shed uh, and the Fechen Flyers. Uh, and it's also very fitting that they will be joined by local cyclists on the way to Edinburgh Castle and by numerous international friends as they complete uh, the journey to New York State, making it both a local and a global commemoration. I'm particularly pleased to see that the fundraising will benefit Soul Soup, a mental health charity for 12 to 15 year olds in Dumfries and Galloway. I was privileged to attend the opening of Soul Soup a few years ago and have seen it firsthand the invaluable support it offers in a very friendly and informal uh, environment, which is very much led by the young people themselves, so it's a fantastic charity to be benefiting from this. Uh, 30 years after the Lock Lockerbie disaster, uh, we are all far more aware of how adverse childhood experiences can affect the mental health of teenagers uh, and young adults uh, and throughout their lives. And I know from speaking to some local people who were children or teenagers at the time of the Lockerbie disaster, that the trauma of the experiences at that time have left lasting scars. And that's why I wanted to finish by mentioning another commemoration initiative proposed by some of those who were directly affected um, by the disaster when they were young and who contacted me earlier this week. Uh, local environmental artist and curator Jan Hogarth and John Wallace, a filmmaker and former Syracuse scholar, both experienced the disaster that night, John as a child and Jan as a young art, uh, art school student home for Christmas. 
and they hope to conduct and film a peace prayer walk at dawn uh, on the morning of the commemoration. The proposed walk is at Burnsworth Hill, a very special and spiritual local landmark close to the place where the cockpit landed and with a 360 degree view of the landscape where so many souls came to rest. The proposed prayer walk would be interfaith and non-denominational and walkers would carry flags from around the world to reflect the diversity of the people on the plain. And the artists are in discussion with the uh, Allenton World Peace Sanctuary near Dumfries to discuss how best to organise any walk as sensitively as possible. And I know they're speaking to members of the local community as well. And although it's early days, I, I want to wish them well in their endeavours. In the meantime, I am again delighted to express my support for Cycle uh, to Syracuse Lockerbie Memorial Tour, uh, which is already well underway and will involve so many people from Scotland and around the world between now and the 21st of December. Thank you very much. Finlay Carson, followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'd like to thank Oliver Mundell for bringing this important debate to the Chamber this evening on a subject which I know is important to many of my colleagues and, of course, to many of my constituents. Each year there are private events which take place in Dumfries and Galloway and across the USA to remember, most of which we will be, una to remember, most of which we will be unaware of as we go about our daily lives. 30 years on, for me, as someone who was living in Dumfries and Galloway the night of the 21st of December 1988, it will be a night that will always stay with me. I just turned 21, and I clearly remember the evening, arriving in the King's Arms after an evening with the young farmers, and we were met by the news that a plane had crashed in Lockerbie. We all thought it was a joke. And then the picture started to come through, and the questions were asked, was it a low-flying military jet, as we often experienced, but it soon became apparent it was much greater than that. I remember sitting up throughout the night with a good friend, Dean Lindsay, trying in vain to get through to his brother, who lived near Sherwood Crescent. All the telephone lines were down. And that brought the, the horror home. It really was a disaster unfolding in front of our eyes. And there was no mobile phones. And I remember the tension of the lack of news coming through. We, of course, know now that it wasn't a military jet or a simple plane crash. It was Pan Am Flight 103, a transatlantic flight from Frankfurt to Detroit via London and New York, brought down by a terrorist bomb, killing all 259 on board and 11 on the ground. It had a huge impact on the people right across Dumfries and Galloway, with few families not, not touched by the events. Willie Johnston, a BBC reporter with Radio Solway, who's just retired after 35 years, arrived on the scene only hours after the explosion. His contribution is still clear in my mind. As well as telling the news of what happened in the aftermath, he also had the voice that provided a vital information link between the authorities and the community. My cousin Gordon McKnight, who I know uh, joined the police force just shortly before Colin did, was only four months in the job when he was in st stationed in the initial mortuary in the town hall traveling the 86 miles from Stranraer on a daily basis for a 16-hour shift. A hugely traumatic eye-opener for a young cop who'd only seen a few bodies before then. He became the area inspector for the Lockerbie area, and 27 years after the events, the memories of those dark days are st still very much there. The local police force, the smallest in Scotland, the local community, local authority, emergency services and support workers made a huge effort on the ground, which I know will never be forgotten by the families hit by this tragedy. Colin Dorrance was, a site on the police, was on site as a policeman 30 years ago. At that time, he was the youngest policeman in the whole of Scotland. And as we've heard, Colin has taken the lead in the cycle to Syracuse. This is a community initiative in, instigated by the people and services in Lockerbie to remember all those who were lost and to honour the response of the community and emergency services and to show support for all who suffered in the times that followed. To mark this 30th anniversary, four emergency service cyclists and the head teacher of Lockerbie Academy will complete that journey that the 35 Syracuse students never completed. The challenge over 3,238 miles from here in Scotland and across in the United States will finish at Syracuse University. It will help funds to raise funds for Soul Soup 
a charity based in the region doing excellent work for people with mental health problems. It's challenges and fundraising ideas such as this that are po the positive legacy from such a horrendous event. It's about people coming together and helping those in greatest need. And nowhere ep epitomizes that spirit better than in Lockerbie and across from Fries and Galloway. Yet again, we have people going above and beyond to help other individuals. I'd like to wish the cycling team the very best of success in their cycle ride, and I would encourage everyone to get behind such a wonderful cause. And as Oliver said, the motto goes, forward Lockerbie. Christine Graham, followed by Colin Smith. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, let me declare an interest as a member of the Justice for Megrahi campaign. Congratulate Oliver Mundell on securing this debate and welcome his so-called Syracuse team to the gallery. It's important to recall that dreadful night nearly 30 years ago with the death of so many, the young students who will be commemorated in that cycle journey with lives ending so tragically, but now the cyclists taking it to the destination they never reached. It also reminds us of, as has been said, the Lockerbie residents, 11 of whom also died that night, and the actions of the professionals who, through their sensitivity and kindness then and over the years, have created a bond across oceans with the families and friends of those killed that night. Lockerbie, like Aberfan and Dunblane before it, never wanted to be in the headlines as a graveyard for so many. Yet it has dealt with that atrocity with grace and dignity. It shouldn't have been Lockerbie, of course. The delay in flight Pan Am 103 meant the bomb, which was probably timed to detonate over the sea without evidential trace, did so over acres of bleak winter Scottish countryside. While I have nothing but admiration for the Lockerbie community, I feel that no line can be drawn under that night until the conviction of Abdul Basit al Megali is finally and fully tried on a last appeal. You will recall that a second appeal on a referral from the Criminal Cases Review Commission was abandoned by Megrahi, in my view, to secure his transfer from Greenock to Libya to be with his family as he succumbed to terminal cancer, evidence to this day which has not been heard. I met him three times, and at my last meeting with him, he made it clear that it was not for himself but his family that he wished his name cleared. He did not want the name Megrahi to forever be part of the Lockerbie atrocity. At this moment, a third application for review is in process with the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission, lodged by his family. I have been told by it that it has passed stage one. In other words, the Commission has accepted his reasons for abandoning that second appeal. In other words, as he thought it would help secure release. It is now at stage two that is, the substance of the grounds for a new appeal are being considered. It hopes to report by the summer of 2019. In the meantime, the separate police-led Sandwood inquiry into the actions of police, prosecutors and forensic officials at the time, which is investigating claims of attempts to pervert the course of justice prior to the campsite trial, is yet to complete and be sent to the Crown Office. Started in 2014, the pronouncements of its imminent conclusion have been much postponed. Now, while the SCCRC could conclude its findings without that report, there is no doubt in my mind it will be difficult for the Commission to fully conclude without it. Sandwood's slow progress, to be kind, gives concern. Because 30 years on, that justice delayed is justice denied for the people of Lockerbie, the Syracuse students, every one of the 270 who died, and their families and friends, and perhaps even the McGrahy family. Thank you. I call Colin Smith to be followed by Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. Can I begin by declaring an interest uh, as my wife is a, a teacher at Locker Bay Academy? Can I also add my thanks to, to Oliver Mundell for his motion, which reflects on the, the tragic events of 30 years ago on the 21st of December 1988, when 259 passengers and crew, along with 11 residents of Locker Bay, lost their lives in the bombing of Pan Am 103. The motion rightly urges us to recognise the truly humbling response of the community 
and emergency services to that tragedy at the time and since. Like others who live in Dumfries, I've met many of those people who did indeed respond at the time. My then neighbour, who was a nurse and who responded to the messages that flashed up on our TV screens on board our TV that evening, asking all medical professionals to report to Dumfries and Galloway Royal Infirmary. But given the finality of events, sadly, there were no survivors there for her to treat. The family friend, who was a council catering worker at the time, who helped feed hundreds and hundreds of rescue workers over many long days and long evenings. And the local newspaper photographer whose home overlooked Lockerbie and whose photographs appeared with no personal gain to him on the front pages of newspapers across the world the following day. President officer, we could go on and on about the remarkable people at the sharp end of the response to the Lockerbie bombing from the community and emergency services, many of whom worked tirelessly for days on end, trying to cope and helping others to cope with the magnitude of the destruction they faced. So it's right that we recognise them and the organisers of the cycle to Syracuse are to be congratulated for doing just that as they embark on their 3,238 miles to Syracuse University, involving the community in particular hundreds of young people every step, or should I say every pedal, along the way. Because remembering and paying appropriate tribute is what the people of Lockerbie have always done. When you visit the town itself, you'll see that the peaceful memorials to those who lost their lives located in Sherwood Crescent, Rosebank Crescent, and the Memorial Garden in Drivesdale Cemetery. In 2003, the former caretaker house at the entrance to the cemetery was developed into a visitor centre by the community to provide a space for visitors to reflect, but also for exhibitions charting the proud history of Lockerbie. Volunteers at the centre have played a quiet but important role in helping those who lost loved ones to grieve, find peace, but also explore Lockerbie and the surrounding areas. In the town hall in the centre of Lockerbie, you will also see another memorial, the dramatic stained glass window which depicts the flags of the 21 countries who lost citizens in the bombing. But it isn't just about physical memorials. As we've already heard, a lasting legacy has formed through the Syracuse scholarship created between Lockerbie Academy and Syracuse University, who lost 35 of its students in the bombing. The scholarship allows two students every year from the academy to spend a year at Syracuse before they begin their university studies. But in addition to the, the two Lockerbie scholars, who this year are, are Joe Holland and Harriet Graham, there are also 35 remembrance scholars who study at Syracuse University every year. In 2003, the then rector of Lockerbie Academy, Graham Herbert, was recognised at Syracuse University with the Chancellor's Medal for Outstanding Service. And this year, his successor, Brian Asher, will be one of the five who cycle from Lockerbie to Syracuse, adding another fitting legacy by raising money to provide vital mental health counselling services for local young people. But, President Officer, it's worth reflecting on the fact that the outward-looking international focus of the town's academy and young people goes beyond those strong links fostered by the tragedy of 30 years ago. Next year, the academy will celebrate a decade of its strong partnership with the Thawali Primary School in the Milanji district of Malawi, which has included raising funds for the development of a Mary's Meal feeding station at the school and the setting up of a scholarship programme to support a number of pupils at Thawali through to secondary education. For 30 years, young people have also been at the heart of the development of the wonderful S-Rig Reserve on the edge of the town by the Lockerbie Wildlife Trust, led by former principal teacher of biology at the Academy, Jim Ray, who for two decades taught students biology at the reserve. Lockerbie is also famous internationally for its love of curling as a home of one of Scotland's oldest curling rinks, giving rise to world and European champions and Olympians of all ages. President officer, I make these points because although it is so important to reflect on the tragic loss of the, the Maid of the Seas over Lockerbie in 1988, which will of course always be part of the town's story, we should also recognise that 30 years on, there is so much that is positive to reflect on about the town of Lockerbie, which is a vibrant, proud and forward-looking community. In the meantime, can I wish all those involved in the cycle to Syracuse all the best and good luck. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions is from Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. First of all, I'd like to congratulate Oliver Mundell for bringing forward this motion uh, this evening, the cycle to Syracuse, to mark the 30th anniversary of the Lockerbie disaster. I can't even believe that it's 30th year anniversary, actually, since Pan Am Flight 103 crashed on the town of Lockerbie and in the surrounding fields on December the 21st, just before Christmas in 1988. Oliver Mundell's motion and indeed his speech shows that while we remember and reflect, we can still look forward. 
And I would like to acknowledge the cycle charity ride by the team, the Lockerbie Memorial Tour 2018 from Lockerbie to Syracuse, which includes members of Echo Fecken Base Cycling Club, the Fecken Flyers. It is worth noting that many children will perform the virtual cycle ride as both Oliver Mundell and Joe McAlpine have mentioned. This is testament to the resilience that occurs following adversity. Oliver's motion mentions the police, ambulance, fire service and mountain rescue all were involved. I commend all of the emergency services personnel for current work and previously who took part on that night and in the subsequent hours, days and weeks following this, the UK's worst terrorist air disaster. This was an extremely tough time for many. And last year, I heard particular detail from one of the fire and rescue service personnel who attended that night and on the following days as he chose to share his very personal, often quite emotional recollection with me. And while reflecting on the event myself, I thought about tragedies and disasters that occur across the world. And we often hear where people state exactly where they were when they heard about a particular event, the exact moment. That had me thinking this weekend a lot, in fact, about where I was 30 years ago at the time of this disaster. And a couple of points that I've been reflecting on was that uh, one was from a dairy farmer and uh, one was from me, the nurse. The dairyman was my dad. He said he was checking a coo out in the field that was about to have a calf out in the front field and he heard what he described as a boom or a low sound described as maybe an explosion. And our family home is actually quite a few miles from Tundergrath and Lockerbie. Um, it's about almost eight miles, but could my dad actually have heard the bomb go off from eight miles away? And just after 7.30 p.m. on that night, I received a phone call from my flat from the operating theatre manager. I was walking distance to the Royal Infirmary. Um, we need you to come in, the manager said. There's been a major trauma, a disaster. The hospital disaster plan has been activated. We don't know what's going on yet, but it may be a plane crash, maybe military. My role was to help set up the operating rooms, theatre one for trauma, theatre two for trauma, theatre three for orthopaedic trauma, theatre four for minor injuries and suturing cuts and wounds. We were told to prepare and expect many trauma patients and cases. We set up, we got the rooms ready, we waited and waited. The trauma didn't come. Hundreds were dead. Later, we heard that 270 people lost their lives that night. That experience of preparation, which was calm, organized, and methodical, it helped me years later when the massive Northridge earthquake happened in 1994. And I, as a young new migrant to the USA, was able to work with professionals from perhaps 21 countries, which is similar to the 21 countries where people lost their lives. I was able to work with professionals to care for the victims of that disaster. Presiding officer, a comment about the Shepherd's Crook, which will make its way to the Remembrance Service at Syracuse University by members of the core cycling team marking the 2018 Remembrance Week. I love the fact that wood sourced from Tundergarth has been made into the Shepherd's Crook by members of Lockerbie's Men's Shed. The bike ride, the Shepherd's Crook, are so symbolic and so human and so important. And I recognise and acknowledge the role that Syracuse University plays in providing a focal point for many families who were affected, maintaining an archive and continued fostering of links with the town of Lockerbie and the Lockerbie Academy, which has been mentioned. Look back and act forward. The motto of the Scholarship Remembrance Programme is fantastic. And the town's motto, Forward Looking, has been mentioned by others as well. These are apt terms for us to think about after 30 years. So finally, presiding officer, once again, I thank Oliver Mundell for bringing this important debate to chamber today. And again, I echo his words. Thank you. I call Ash Denham to respond to the debate, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to add my thanks also to Oliver Mundell for securing this debate and for what was a very moving speech on his part, I thought, and to wish you well with your tandem ride um, when it approaches. And also for providing Parliament um, an the opportunity this evening 
to pass on our best wishes to those who will be taking part in the Lockerbie Memorial Tour later this month. And I'd also like to add uh, my voice as well to welcoming the team to the gallery this evening. Um, it's been what I think a very um, good debate this evening, a very thoughtful debate with thoughtful contributions from all the members across the chamber. So I thank them all for, for taking part in this this evening. Um, as we've heard, this event is marking the 30th anniversary of the bombing of Pan Am Flight 103, which remains the worst terrorist attack ever perpetrated in Scotland. 243 passengers, 16 crew and 11 people on the ground were murdered on the 21st of December 1988. And it's important that we do not forget the pain and suffering of the families and friends of those who died that night. Presiding officer, the town of Lockerbie will never forget what happened that fateful evening. The memorial, the remembrance garden, the stained glass windows at the town hall stand as a tribute to those who were killed in this incomprehensible atrocity. Throughout what was a hugely complicated and traumatic investigation and trial, the families and friends of those who died carried themselves with great resilience and also great dignity. People from across the world were affected by this tragedy. And the passenger list included people from 21 different countries. And as our 30th anniversary approaches, our thoughts are with them also. Many of those who were on board were heading back to the United States to celebrate Christmas with their families. And members will be aware that the Lockerbie bombing claimed the lives of 35 students from Syracuse University, as we've heard this evening. And that's 35 young lives who were cut short in their prime. Presiding officer, out of this horrific tragedy has come an outward facing spirit of friendship and companionship by the people of Lockerbie. And the six volunteers that are taking part in the US leg of the cycle challenge will ride from the Lockerbie Cairn at Arlington National Cemetery to Syracuse University and arrive in time to join the university's annual remembrance ceremony. And this reflects the close links which have been formed between the town of Lockerbie and Syracuse University and continue to this day. In the aftermath of the Lockerbie bombing, the Lockerbie Syracuse Trust was established. And each year it gives two students from Lockerbie Academy the opportunity to at attend Syracuse University for one academic year. And Syracuse University and the Lockerbie Syracuse Scholarship Trust meet the costs of their attendance jointly. And since it was established in 1990, 58 students from Lockerbie Academy have spent a year at Syracuse University, giving those students an opportunity to extend their academic education, experience what life is like in another country, and to develop their self-confidence and their independence. All of the things that those 35 Syracuse students had been doing before their lives were taken on that fateful night. The motto of Syracuse Remembrance Week is think back act forward as we've heard this evening. And the Lockerbie Memorial Challenge is acting forward by raising money to help young people closer to home. The money raised will go to support Soul Soup, a mental health charity based in the Dumfries and Galloway area. Statistics published recently in the Scottish Health Survey found that 21% of young people aged 16 to 24 reported that they'd self-harmed. And this only highlights the importance of providing support to young people who are experiencing mental health difficulties. Soul Soup works in the Dumfries area to provide free counselling and support to young people in the region who may be in need of help, who might need somebody to talk to, who might need to be referred to a specialist counselling or treatment service, or who might need advice and guidance as they navigate their way through the stresses and strains of growing up. The aim of this challenge is to provide sufficient funding to help place a dedicated Soul Soup worker at Lockerbie Academy to serve the school and the youth of the lo local Lockerbie community. And presiding officer, I'd also like to highlight the contribution that's being made by the school children who are helping to meet the challenge of cycling the total distance of 3,238 miles between Lockerbie and Syracuse. And of course, you can't actually cycle across the Atlantic Ocean. So the first part of the challenge has involved children from 12 local schools on their own bikes or on exercise bikes at schools. And they're seeking to complete um, the 2,568 mile combined cycle at events which began in September and will conclude with an event at Lockerbie Academy on the 10th of October. So I wish the best of luck to all of those who are participating in the Lockerbie Memorial Tour. 
And on the 13th of October, the team will set off from Lockerbie Academy to ride to Edinburgh Castle, accompanied by other cyclists from Lockerbie and members of the Echo Fekin based cycle club, the Fekin Flyers. And when they reach the castle, there will be a reception to welcome them and others who have helped in organising the event, um, which the Cabinet Secretary for Justice will also be attending. So I hope the weather holds good for them on that day and they have a southerly wind to help them on their way up to the castle, because I think that could be quite a difficult part. Um, in the spirit that has been formed from adversity and those taking part are truly thinking back, acting forward in a very inspiring manner. Thank you. That concludes the debate and this meeting is closed.